Let's start with a little introduction about each and every one of you, and then we'll move into some trends and talk about investing in this market, investing in general, what exchanges look like. So, please, Mate. Sure. Thank you, Mo. Hello? Hello, hello? Oh, we'll wait a bit. Yeah. Hello? You hello? Good? Mate? I'm, I'm still not good. Hmm. You're not. No. Oh, yeah, you're oh, on. Okay. Hello. Yeah, I'm on. Good. Thanks, Mo. Uh, this is Mate Toke. I'm the CEO at Bitcoin.com. <laughs> Perfect. That's good. <laughs> yeah. My name is James Putra. I'm head of product strategy for TradeStation Crypto. Uh, thank you all for coming and listening to us. Hopefully, we have something good to share. Uh, we are retail brokers and um, bring crypto to the markets. Great. I'm Steve Schaefer. I'm Chief Operational Officer at MGT Capital. We're uh, primarily a Bitcoin miner that's publicly traded on the OTCQB. Um, and uh, we're expanding our businesses beyond mining, so pleasure to be here. My name is Martin Yard. I'm the Managing Director of the Barbados Stock Exchange. Um, we are a traditional exchange regulated by the Financial Services Commission in Barbados. And we are looking to get into the listing and trading of digital assets, particularly securitized tokens. Which is super exciting to see a regulated traditional exchange get involved with digital assets. We're not seeing a lot of that. Um, talking about how interfacing with mainstream, because we are all touching that in some way. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on interfacing now that, you know, it's been a while since we, we all hoped this would happen. And now we have some people that are actually doing it. Yeah. What, what have been the hurdles going through this for you? Well, I, I'm part of a, a working group in Barbados where we saw the opportunity and we sat together and we looked to see how we can make it work in Barbados. One of the things we looked at is our, uh, our regula regulatory framework, particularly our Securities Act. And we determined from our meetings that once you pass certain criteria, and we, we looked at it how we test in the US, you invest in money, um, you are common enterprise with the intention of making a profit um, through the efforts of other persons, and we had the same characteristics in our securities legislation, and we said, well look, we can do this. We spoke to our regulators, um, they were attended the, the, the working group meetings in advisory capacity, and we spoke to them and we said, this is what we want to do. And they said, once the, the, the particular digital asset, and we've said the digital asset, once the particular digital asset meets the, the criteria of a security, we can list them and trade them. So we started the process talking to various people in, in, in the marketplace. And one, one of the persons who we, we consulted a lot with was actually uh, Gabriel Abed from BIT in Barbados. Uh, he's been pushing this a great deal on our side. And so we talked to various peoples and, and we developed a body of rules um, to allow us to, to, to list and trade. And we've had those rules, the rules are now before the, um, our regulated financial services commission and they are reviewing them with, the, with hopefully with the intent to approve them. And we expect to ha that to happen shortly. So it's amazing to see something like that happening in Barbados and the speed and agility in which you can talk to people, have a working group, invite people from the industry to make some decisions and some framework with it. Looking at Wall Street, and Stephen, you had an, you've had experience in Wall Street, but besides for the shutdown, like how, how agile is the American government to adopt something as fast and as uh, inviting as Barbados is doing? I think it's easier to, to turn the Barbados ship in the harbor than the U.S. government <laughs> ship. We would all agree on that. Um, with that being said, I think uh, I'm actually happy with the speed at which the SEC and Jay Powell and these, uh, the government bodies are really looking into crypto and realizing that we need to create proper protocols uh, for, for funding, uh, create a protocol for proper adherence to Reg D in the case of Reg D offerings. Um, so I'm happy with that. Um, I think the biggest hurdle in the U.S. is the volatility. Mm. You know, the, the U.S. regulators, I think they're scared shit of the volatility that we have in our markets. And, you know, the, uh, the fact that we've gone from 
you know, $1,800 to 19000 back to 3500 you know, for, for an equities trader like me, that's just another cycle. I've been through three of them. I've traded and lived and worked through three of them. They go up, they go down, you ride them out, and the ones that survive, I always say the last man standing on, on the down cycle is the first to market guy on the next cycle on the way up. So I think that's all we need to do is just smooth out the volatility, and that'll help the U.S. regulators sleep at night and allow us to do what we have to do. Yeah. We're also finding, too, from our side is that the technology infrastructure maturity is weak. I mean, we're, so we've been dealing with other exchanges and liquidity providers for many years under the broker side. And we're used to talking in a fixed language with very mature APIs. Mm -hmm. and can, when something goes to market, we have an assurance that it got there. And then when we start to approach the crypto exchanges and the crypto markets, they implemented an easy API, usually a RESTful API. And a lot of times we'll send a message, we'll hear nothing back. Mm -hmm. So that can't happen. Like that kind of interface between the mass audience and the crypto markets cannot happen. The other part that, that we see is a lot of the information is hard to come by. So there's a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. The experts in the space have been around 10 years. Uh, it's confusing over actually what is real, what's not real. Um, there's debate on Bitcoin, what's Bitcoin, what's not Bitcoin. So this is stuff yeah. that we have to try to overcome on times yeah. of standardization and process of information. Let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about this with you, Mate, as well. This, uh, it was clear in late 20. 18, uh, late 2017, early 2018, September, October, that there was a massive asymmetry of information going on. Mm -hmm. um, it's still going on. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, how have you seen that? Also on the new site, on Bitcoin.com, how have you seen the asymmetry? Is, is, because if there's an asymmetry of information, there's a much, th this, you can't smooth out the hype cycles. Right, but if you think about it, there isn't only asymmetry information going on in the cryptocurrency industry. I think it is really general for mainstream media as well, and it's been you know all over the news, and especially in the U.S. when uh, when Trump and politicians have been complaining about yeah, you know CNN says one thing and then Fox says another. Uh, you know, you're sitting home watching TV. Who are you going to believe? The mm -hmm. same thing is happening with cryptocurrencies in mm -hmm. the industry. You know, there's. One camp saying one thing, and then there's another, uh, another camp saying another thing. Uh, I think the problem about that is uh, cryptocurrencies in general are really complicated. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, you know, we're in this investment panel, we're talking about things that the average Joe doesn't understand at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not only that the average Joe doesn't understand, it's there is more to it because. You know, what doesn't the average Joe understand? Because one, one camp says one thing that the average Joe doesn't understand, and there's another camp that says another thing. So now, you know, an average investor is even more confused. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a big, giant problem, and, you know, lack of education. And, um, I mean, but it's, it's great to see what, you know, happening in Barbados. But also, you know, when it comes to sharing information, it is just something people usually don't understand. No. To get a sense of the market right now, it seems, from an investment point of view, like I'm optimistic that these issues of bad APIs and weak exchanges will improve over time. Mm. They have to. Yeah. Right, what, what, what is your sense of it? I mean, just watching uh, T-Zero's presentation, you can see that there is, people are making huge headway mm into mm -hmm. overcoming some of these hurdles? So I think if, if it's kind of where the talent went. So early days in crypto, it was very technology focused and uh, kind of anti-banking, anti-Wall Street. And over the last few years, it's been a big drain where the crypto world has pulled in experienced players from banking and uh, brokerage and exchanges. So it's been really positive to bridge that knowledge gap and kind of made it so that the two worlds can start talking together. So. While we are having those challenges today, I don't foresee that to be very long before those are worked out. Uh, as you get more players like T0 or other brokerage firms or other exchanges get involved, that market structure maturity is going to happen really quick. Don't you have a feeling it is going really slow, though? For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Institutions move really slow. We move incredibly slow. Well, if, if I can add to, to that, you know, I'm an early Gen X person, and I got into understanding this space late. And Every time I try to, why I did, how I educated myself about is obviously meeting and talking with people. But I try to relate it back to what we do now. Mm. And you know, my staff he tell me, you know, Marlon, you know, it, 
this thing is different. But as time go, go, went on, you know, bringing people, you know, traditionalists, I would like to say, into the business, as time went on, I understood what was happening and how it could empower people and how it could really free up the, the marketplace. And my challenge was to make, to, to, to make sure that from a regulatory point of view, that we were doing things the right way. Uh, you know, reputational risk is a big thing. For exchanges, we are uh, licensed by, by a regulator at the FSC. Um, confidence and trust is what brings business in, into your organization. And yet, the other thing too is that in the early stages, it seemed to be the wild, wild west. You know, everything was happening, there was no structure. But I'm finding out that as certain jurisdictions try to understand it, as international standard setters try to realize that this thing is happening. You know, there's more structure and, and regulatory framework coming to bear on the, on the marketplace. And that is what would bring mainstream into, into the space because at the end of the day, there needs to be that framework. There needs to be certainty, some degree of certainty. I know the space is more decentralized and, you know, um, the, the whole question anonymity comes into play. But the only, to me, in my view, the only way to get mainstream into it is to bring certainty to it, have a better regulatory framework in place, given what is being tried to achieve in, in the crypto asset, in crypto asset space, and, and I, that will. But, but that's what, that starts to help the structure of information and yes. what you can and can't say. Yes. If it's a security, there are specific things you can say and you mm -hmm. cannot say. Once you, as we start to come closer to that world, I would hope and I would expect that you would start to see more standardization of how information is conveyed to the, the broader audience. Yeah. And then we can answer some of these questions and kind of get a better sense that what is said uh, uh, an investor could rely on. Uh, they'll have, be able to have better research and better tools. Yeah. But you would, you would find too that once that structure comes into play, it will bring in more people in, into the marketplace. Confidence will, 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 will develop and but, more people will come in. But there's two things in. that play here, right? There's the first part, which is let's ideally not have regulation put the brakes on any innovation. Yes. Ideally. ideally. At the same time, because the market is moving and investments are happening, we need to be careful and follow the rules mm -hmm. that exist and try not to push the envelope too much. What are some risks when mainstream banks do come into the industry? They trust what they read. They trust so everything it, it, that it they read. It is an information thing. Yeah, and I think there's a proximity issue. So uh, like people like most people on the panel, we're much closer to the sun than the mass mm -hmm. retail audience. So uh, on Bitcoin.com, you'll hear things that are really closely tied to the industry. And as you start to expand out that universe into maybe a, a Bloomberg or, or CNBC, it gets farther away and that information is diluted. But I, I'm also talking about, and maybe Stephen, you could add to this. Mm -hmm. um, if... Wall Street firms get involved. I'm imagining a situation they come up with financial instruments that we've right. never seen before mm -hmm. to do some crazy things that this is child's play. They'll be doing some, some crazy mortgage backed loans and default swaps and creating new products every day, you know, leveraging 500x instead of 100x on crypto. Mm -hmm. Look, it's, it, as a Wall Streeter, an ex Wall Streeter, I could tell you, it's just a matter of Wall Street being able to make money on it. You know, there are, Wall Street's there for profit. It's a for-profit generator. Uh, so for the benefits that Wall Street brings, which is large institutional money, uh, regulatory risk, whether that's the dilemma, do we see the regulatory risk as good or bad? I've always been one coming from that background. I felt, I think four years ago, you know, I got booed off a stage because I said, we need more regulation. Well, I felt we did, and I still think we need more because... There's no way that Wall Street is going to bring, is going to, <laughs> there's no way that Wall Street's going to bring fiduciary money into the asset class without having protocols, identities of, of data or validation of data. I mean, we don't even have something as simple as a SIP processor. In the equities market, there's what's called the security information processing system. All trades are basically on a New York Stock Exchange they all report back to the SIP. So there's yeah. a central data that all the other exchanges pull from to create their markets. Yeah. We don't even have that. So you have right now, you have firms that are taking advantage of everyone in this audience that's trading any, let's talk Bitcoin, 
I mean, there's $10, $20 spreads on some of these exchanges. And we have firms that are out there that are algorithmically eating everybody's lunch by arbitra arbitraging throughout the world. And we yeah. need to, I'm not saying we shouldn't eliminate ARBs, but we need to centralize, and I'm probably going to get booed again, the data. <laughs> and we need to bring it where it's more transparent and more verifiable. So off of that, the money managers, the Wall Street fiduciaries can sleep at night because they know that they're relying on what is somewhat of an accurate data feed to be able to recommend these assets to their institutional and retail clients. Yeah. But that cost per trade is massive. I don't know if you guys realize what mm -hmm. one percentage point is. Yep. You trade a one percentage, so the commission or a spread on a Bitcoin might be one percent. If you trade one Bitcoin, you're talking that today's price is $35 in, $35 right. out. That's massive. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's incredible. And then if you start trading any of the crosses, those spreads are even wider and you may be paying a couple of hundred basis points. Yeah. Right. So how, what do you think, how long is it going to take to build that out, that infrastructure? I think it's going to be a couple of years before it's really dressed for the dance and ready to go full, <laughs> you know, prime time. So I think we're at least a year and a half, two years away. Um, I think we'll have, I think BACT is a great example. You know, I think that's a first step. Um, one day, you know, uh, physical delivery futures, but I, I think ultimately what we need for, the, for you know, and I'm a Bitcoin guy, so I'll stick to Bitcoin. Um, I think for Bitcoin to really become ubiquitous where everybody's sitting here, you know, half of the people in this room probably have an E-Trade, Ameritrade, or some online trading account, uh, and they're buying and selling stocks for three, four bucks a trade. For that to happen and allow people to do the same with Bitcoin, we need the, this infrastructure and this technology gap to close and we're definitely two years away, from, I think, from that. Really, I, I understand all of that, but I think you know regulations are, you know, in general, uh, slowing things down. Mm -hmm. And I believe by we get there, in terms of you know regulating all of what we just talked about, there are going to be decentralized exchanges. And you know what what are regulators going to do about so that? That's interesting. That's very interesting to talk about the decentralized. I like decentralized exchanges, but when you start looking at how the what we have to do from an AML perspective. The AML services are flagging decentralized exchanges as high risk venues, which means it's going to make it I really understand, hard. but there's nothing you can so, do about it. So, so I'm not criticizing that. All I'm saying is it makes it very hard for another entity to work with a high risk uh, exchange. Yeah. And so there's a lot of them that were, are flagged now. A centralized exchange is being flagged as low risk. So we need to try to figure that out to make yeah. sure there's more clarity in what they're actually mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. I think generally there's some optimism that. With maturity, there'll be more robust exchanges with the global liquidity pool to reduce costs. Yeah. Yeah. That we're optimistic about, and smart people are building these things, mm, which yeah. is good. Yeah. How far away are we? It's unclear, right? Yeah. Claire? I don't know. Hopefully soon. I hope so. Well, <laughs> trade station, any talk of developing products or bringing products to the marketplace, or is it still too early? So we are planning to launch in 2019, and I think that we're positioning as a brokerage, which in traditional markets, the regulators put the onus on the brokerage firms to ensure client suitability and mm -hmm. what can a client actually invest in. And so we're taking that approach. We think that that is the direction that the industry will ultimately move with sort of separation of concerns between an exchange that functions as an exchange, a custodian that functions as a custodian, and a broker that functions as a broker. It allows them to be specialists in those different areas, which should help and provide better customer experiences, lower costs in, in yeah. many of the different concerns. Now, um, I do like the idea of kind of wiping out the middlemen, but in some aspects, you need some of these parties to be involved, at least in the near term. Maybe long term, we're able to completely wipe them out. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. In the near term future, we'll need to have some middleware. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal is, obviously, let's reduce these high-fee, low-service players and, and uh, figure out a solution to that. But I, I was just one thing, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, the, if you look what happened in the equity markets when you brought on online brokers, they drove the cost from $100 a trade on the phone mm -hmm. down to $5 a trade. Yeah. I would expect to see that same type of consolidation in the crypto venues. Today, if you trade with an exchange, you're going one person to the exchange. If you trade through a, an aggregator or a broker, it's one huge firm going against the exchange, so they're already buying down the volume tiers. So it should cause a lot of pricing pressure on the existing exchanges. And uh, yeah. firms like, like us or Fidelity or Ameritrade, we make money on multiple asset classes, so we don't rely just on the making a fortune on the crypto trade. So that should cause some 
pricing pressure and potential consolidation in the exchange over the next couple of years. But, but what, the question I would ask is, what can we do to, to get more people involved? How can we raise the, the buy-in, so to speak, um, to um, the space, particularly digital assets, securitized tokens? And it goes, it goes back to some of the traditional things we already, we already do, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that is important, you know. I remember uh, last year at, at, at our conference at the Stock Exchange, we hosted, we hosted a corporate governance conference every year, and, and I, I coined a term at that, at that conference called crypto governance, you know, how, how these companies and these, these tech companies are, are governed, their governance structure is very important and, and, and it allows people, again, confidence is, is the thing. That's what drives uh, markets, confidence. So the governance structures, or as I say, the crypto governance within these, these companies uh, are very important too. And sometimes we can't go too far left that we, mm -hmm. we, we, we miss the opportunities that might be in the middle. But it, it's not just, I 100% mean, agree with you. I think to get really the mass adoption in this yeah. space, they can't know they're dealing with crypto. They can't know what the underlying framework is. They just have to know they're engaging in some activity and it's just happening behind the hood. If you look at the investment market, I think it's 54% of the U.S. population touches equities in some yes, form. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's a tiny fraction that actually discretionary trade that are outside of mutual funds. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be the same type of deal in crypto investments, maybe even smaller. So as you're building products, you've got to think about how do I hide all this nonsense from people? We love crypto. We all love it. And yeah. Yeah, you, most you've got to make it simple, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's it. You, you have to simplify and yeah. clarify yeah. The, 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 space so that people can understand. Once people understand what is happening and what they're getting involved in, they, they, they will get involved. Mm -hmm. We need more conferences, Mo. Educate people. <laughs> it's education. <laughs> it's education and I think it's also opportunity. You know, uh, uh, you know, as TradeStation, E-Trade, Ameritrade, inter Interactive Brokers, all these online platforms start to offer a simple single click as easy as buying an ETF. You can, yeah. you know, buy by the digital assets, I think that's when that ease of, of execution is, is really going to, we'll have that hockey stick event, you know, where it's going to go from, from here to here and, and as far as in the knowledge base and, you know, I mean, f three years ago, how many people knew what a Bitcoin was? You know, yeah. it's certainly in America, it was under 1%. Yeah. I'm sure it's, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen studies, but I'm sure it's double digits now. So uh, I think we'll see from an investment perspective we'll see that same type of hockey stick event where our adoption uh, or interaction within the asset class will jump from some small number, you know, three or fourfold within a year, and that's, uh, that's when it hits the six o'clock news again and, you know, becomes a reality. Yeah. Hey, um, you, you need to get really healthy liquidity. You need to figure out that NBBO type infrastructure. We need to find ways, so the derivatives are going to be really important in the space that allow people to maybe go long futures, short crypto or short crypto mm -hmm. long futures, start taking options contracts that allow market makers and other participants to really offset their risk books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're going to start to see much healthier liquidity. Today, it's a challenge and it's really complicated if you want to short. You're going to go borrow from somebody, put in your wallet and sell it on the exchange. There's no like electronic system that right. really makes yeah. it easy for you to actually see what's happening in your portfolio. Hopefully, we can fix that pretty soon. Custody. Uh, Custody. Custody is a huge, huge step. Yeah. Mm. I mean, take for example, when I was coming into Miami International Airport, you know, they asked you the standard questions. So, so what are you doing? You know, why are you here in the United States? And I said, well, I'm here to speak at a, uh, a Bitcoin conference. So right away you- Wrong yeah. answer. Right. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, He's he, really he, brave, though. Please open your phone. <laughs> no, you, well, <laughs> We're I, really I, glad you made it, though. <laughs> no, and the, 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 the officer engaged me, you know, he says he's, he's trying to understand it. So it's amazing, you know, people are, un, you know, getting into it and trying to understand. And we were there for about two, three minutes, and, you know, everybody passing me, you know, probably think they can carry me in some back room now. <laughs> but I was just engaging the conversation about um, Bitcoin and crypto assets and, and things like that. So there is the awareness and people are getting into more of it. As you say, it would take more time. Education is key. But... There's awareness. I, th I think you're right. Uh, I say wrong answer because three years ago, going through the London airport, I said I was involved in Bitcoin. <laughs> now I just say I'm an architect. Nobody asks any questions. <laughs> yeah. um, but I also remember five years ago, I was in Las Vegas uh, with some guys, 
and we were they were having a rodeo show in town, mm-hmm. and we went to the one of the bars in I think the MGM, and they were having a big rodeo conference, and everybody there was cowboys. And we said, "How many people in this place do you think knows what Bitcoin is?" The answer is zero. Uh, but two weeks ago, there was a report coming out of London: ninety-three percent of people in the UK have heard about crypto in some yeah. way. Mm-hmm. So there's a few th- different things happening at the same time. There's people working on casting a wide enough net to capture as much value as possible when people become even more aware of this. Yeah. At the same time, what we're talking about is regulation is coming, and it's smart regulation is going to encourage companies to grow and flourish yeah. in the right environment. And then we'll see um, easier, more robust technologies that everybody can interface with yeah. and maybe achieve the dream and promise of having quite a crypto future. We've got about 45 seconds left, which is enough for one optimistic thought from each and every one of you. There's a lot of interest in the market. Check out the CoinDesk Market Watch survey. Uh, over half the people surveyed check of the prices daily. There's interest. They're not participating yet, but they're coming. Educate yourself. Visit Bitcoin.com. <laughs> Huge institutional money are going to come into this second half of this year uh, for a few years beyond that, and I think that's the... Uh, the most exciting thing because I think that's what really drives the value of the asset. I would use a paraphrase my, my Prime Minister in Barbados. We will do what we have to do to leapfrog the competition, to let people know that Barbados is open for business. The Barbados Stock Exchange is keen on listing digital assets. We want to list them, we want to trade them, and we're going to play our part in developing the market. Thank you very much. Sure.